Welcome back to Dubious Knowledge. I am Jason. I am one of your hosts. And with me today, we have the trifecta. All three of us, all three hosts are here. Corey, how are you? I'm doing all right. Really cold. The The fall has finally set in up in the, uh, the Great White North up here. But the heaters finally kicked on today, so... Should be getting better soon. Nice, nice. And Mike, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Well rested. Uh, finally have a ta- have a chance to come in and talk some uh, dubious knowledge. I missed talking to you all, and I, I I'm kind of bummed I missed two really great episodes. But I'm excited for this one. Hey, last time you last time you missed it because you were meeting with one of your old Marine buddies. So yeah. you have, you have a great excuse, man. Yeah, I got to see a battle buddy from. I haven't seen him in 10, 10 years, maybe. So it was, you know, a good little surprise. So, yeah, eh, you know, but I missed you guys. Yeah, we missed you too, man. We missed you too. And, um, well, this week, or this week, this month, you can tell that I do a weekly podcast, right? Uh, this month, we have two, two, count them, two special guests with us to talk about the wind and the way. So... First, we have Jason from What Do You Do? How are you? Hey, fellow Jason. We are Legion. It is we, are Legion. To you. we are Legion. We are Legion. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I just recently got done uh, moving between apartments here in New York City uh, over the last like week or so. Yeah. So I'm a little still just kind of like, oh, God, where is everything? And who am I? And. What did I say I was going to do this coming weekend for running a game? Oh, no, I got to update some people about that. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. But otherwise, I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm liking this fall weather, and I am eating a truly ridiculous number of uh, apple cider donuts uh, right now. Delicious. Delicious. It's amazing. Yeah. It's delicious. A it's a New it, York special. It is. Did you at least have an elevator at your new apartment? I, I, I do, and I had an old one, too. At the, or I had one at the old apartment as well, so we've been we've been thoroughly spoiled with our New York experience uh, That's good. so far. That's good. The the funny thing is, this building is uh, well. I'm not going to go into it. Might give away where I am, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's nice. It's it's very nice. Yeah, excellent. And you might have heard another voice joining us this this month as a special guest. Very special guest. We are joined by Dave Nelson. Dave, how are you, sir? I'm pretty good, and I'm happy to talk about my first Paizo contribution. Yes. There have been many more since then, but um, Lost Summons, Gods, and Magic is pretty special to me, so when I heard you guys were doing a episode on Gozra, I figured that you'd jump in. And we are, we are happy to have you. Thank you for joining us. So... Quick disclaimer as we get into it, um, I'm not going to be spoiling anything that is insider Paizo knowledge. Um, I can give you an idea of where my head was at when I wrote the particular things that I wrote, but uh, everything else I say is just me being a fan. Absolutely. Yep. You don't want to, you don't want to spoiler what Gozer's alignment's going to be after the, the remaster change. <laughs> it's going to be literally nothing. It's literally nothing. The end. Yes, <laughs> is right now. Actually. The current end stands for nothing now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, before oh. we before we get into it, should we start off with the basics? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as Dave already mentioned, we are speaking about Gozray today. Like usually, usual, I'll open with a passage from his holy, his or her holy text. Respect the sea and the sky, lest we bring you ruin. Which is from hymns to the wind and the waves. And uh, that is one of Gozra's titles, along with Iozum, the Sky Father, Hyjarth in Torithia, she who guides the wind and the waves. Gozra is the dualistic deity of nature, a god of the storm and sky, and also a goddess of the waves and the surf. Born of the ocean's fury and the wind's wrath, Gozra is a fickle deity. 
Gozer only has one edict, and that is to cherish, protect, and respect nature in all its forms. Anathema to Gozra is to bring civilization to intrude on the wild, to create undead, to despoil areas of natural beauty. Uh, areas of concern are nature, weather, and the sea. Currently, Gozra's alignment is neutral. Soon it will be, as we previously said, nothing, uh, which it pretty much already is. Currently allows followers of the neutral good, lawful neutral, neutral, chaotic neutral, or neutral evil alignments. Just any of that T section there. Um, domains in first edition were air, animal, plant, water, weather, with subdomains of cloud, decay, growth, ocean, seasons, and wind. Second edition are air, nature, travel, and water with alternative domains of cold and lightning. Favored weapon is the trident. Worshippers are typically druids, sailors, woodsmen, and farmers with centers of worship all throughout the room, really. The Mwangi, Vidrian, the Shackles, the Sodden Lands, Thuvia, and then Verissia. Uh, and then holy symbol is a dripping leaf and he, they make their home on the material plane, unlike so many of the goddesses and gods. So I think the first thing that at least I want to bring up is every time that I hear the edict for Gazra, which is just keep nature from being despoiled, and this is probably a deep cut, uh, but since I'm a millennial, uh, if anybody remembers the um, stop motion show Robot Chicken, yes, they had a sketch once where Ted Turner believes he's Captain Planet, and he starts screaming at the top of his lungs, "Captain Planets!" and proceeds to murder any CEOs that are um, causing environmental devastation. And uh, there's a line in that sketch where he says, "Protect the environment, or I'll effing kill you." Oh my! And God. that's <laughs> always kind of how I've seen Gosford Druids. That is amazing. I forgot about that one. That was is great. That, honestly, if you are not going to protect the environment with your life, you can help the environment with your death by being compost. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that the really reason. does sum up their druids yeah. and clerics and yeah. worshippers. Yeah, one of the reasons I wanted to do Gazra was because I always have enjoyed druids that are just a little bit unhinged and yeah kind of act against what conventional adventuring would be because their druid stuff really kind of impedes that mm -hmm. i had a player in college back when i played 3.5 who missed a session and the party made a deal with a bunch of loggers to get rid of some native fey so that they could continue logging not really thinking about what the druid was going to say when he got back Next session, he was incredibly displeased, left for a bit, and it turned out he went down and burned the entire logging camp to the ground, including the loggers. <laughs> and that's when we found out you can have neutral evil druids. Sure can, yeah. <laughs> uh, I had a, in the very first Pathfinder campaign that I ran, which was a Rise of the Rune Lords campaign a decade ago now, one of my players was playing a cleric of Gozra who had the fire is nature's cleanser mentality well, and tried to burn well, down is. multiple multiple dungeon locations and wound up getting killed because of it because one of the places he tried to burn down had a uh, a phantasmal killer tied to it when you tried to burn the place. <laughs> Whoops. That'll learn them. <laughs> learn real quick. Yeah. I'm just going to take all my Captain Planet jokes and just throw them aside now. Cause... Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Did I ruin that for you? <laughs> no, not at all. I have. I have a, I could just keep bringing them up. I just knew. I was like, Captain Planet is just the easiest just one. ever top that sketch in <laughs> terms of uh, true and sweaty for nature. <laughs> no. Yeah. Because nature is scary. 
Right, sure exactly. So another thing that I like, just kind of right off the bat with Gozer, is that typically in these different environments where you are doing tabletop RPGs. Your Pantheon is not something you kind of worship as an entire unit. Always people boil it down, mostly because of clerics and paladins, down to this is your god and you don't care about any of the others. Mm -hmm. And I think Gozer is a really good example of one that you need to care about, even if it's not your patron deity. Because yeah. Gosra is really kind of the epitome of the deity that they are so powerful that they don't notice what mortals do most of the time unless it's big enough to really tick them off. Mm -hmm. You can please them as well, but usually they respond out of rage rather than gratitude. So there's a few passages in a bunch of Gosra articles where sailors and merchants will drop cargo into the ocean hoping that that pleases goes and there's no actual anecdotal evidence that this does anything for good or for bad but you kind of got to risk it otherwise goes is probably going to sink your ship and it's better to try right yeah at least put the at least put the effort out there yeah i right, remember exactly. yeah there was another there was another part of it Oh yeah, this line from one of the one E write ups was that uh, thinking about how military commanders wanting to move troops by ships are especially keen to try and get a blessing from one of Gozer's priests, and the line is like wise generals ask Gozer's blessing before transporting soldiers by sea, and wiser ones ask her priests if a blessing would do any good. And I thought yes. that line was just <laughs> phenomenal, right? It's kinda like because you can go to the temple and you can offer anything you want, but you might as well just save your money and just be like, is this worth it? And they'll say, probably not. And you'll say, okay, great, here we go. At least I could pay my troops, maybe? Okay, we'll see. So, and, and that kind of goes back to, to uh, I have a degree in classics, so a lot of this is going to round back to how religion functions in antiquity. Yeah. But if you look at the Iliad, uh, Agamemnon, in order to try to get to Troy faster, sacrifices his daughter to Poseidon. Now, human sacrifice is a big no-no in the world of Greek myths, and Poseidon takes exception to this and wrecks half his ships for making a bad sacrifice. And then when Agamemnon comes home from Troy, his wife kills him in a bathtub. It's an entire thing. But, the, you know, that's part of it, too, is historically you would want to try to appeal to whoever's going to be moving you and that's the thing that I think gets lost a lot when people are playing at the table is that there's a pantheon for all sorts of things and just because you have a patron deity that you are looking out for the interest for I mean Ioma Day doesn't help you when you're trying to open a bank account so pray to Abadar when you're doing that particular action <laughs> and I think that just gets missed a lot at the table uh, which is something I always encourage with my players yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the tribute to Gozra of dropping cargo into the sea also made me think of the very first deity that we uh, we talked about on this show, because Besmara also has a similar thing going on there. So it makes me wonder if those two ever fight over the treasure that's been left at the bottom of the ocean, like. <laughs> my my thinking is Gosra doesn't really care. Yeah, probably yeah. not. Yeah, Bes I, I Bes think Besmara would be more inclined to have grabby hands, to be honest. <laughs> and Besmara was what? She was just a water elemental who kind of became a deity. She was a water yeah. spirit that ate other spirits to become stronger, basically. Yeah. So it's like I did not know that. That's yeah. new to me. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, Gosra's. Yeah, Besmara's like an ant. To go through. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I also refer to um, to Urgothoa as the original Karen because she was standing in line to be judged by Phrasma and said, "This is taking too long," and then just wandered off, and that's how yep, she got there. Pretty much, she went to go find somebody's manager and instead became the manager instead. So, I, there's some pretty interesting uh, creation myths for a lot of these, but Gozer just kind of 
snapped into being in the sort of the the sentience of Galarian's yeah. name in general, which is why they reside only on the material plane and don't come from elsewhere. Mm. A lot of the other Galarian deities either come from a different plane or go to roost in the different plane when they gain enough divinity to get the hell out of here, but yeah. those are kind of exist only by nature of Galarian existing. Yeah. yeah. Reading about that in, in getting ready for this made me wonder, like, does Gozra have a presence on any other planet? Like, I think, like, he's up, he's not in any way, he, he, she, they are not <laughs> yeah, in all, the, except all yes. <laughs> yeah. Gozra is not in the, the Starfinder pantheon in any way. But right. it does make me wonder, like, is there a, like, are, are they gone now, right? I, I think they're in wherever Starfinder. Galarian is. I personally. suppose so. Like, are they, are, they, are they a confined deity? Like, they're still powerful enough on that planet to be a major deity, but yeah. they're not big enough to actually get out to other planets as well. Yeah. Right. I mean, they, they make up, yeah. as far as I kind of see it, the entire ecosystem of Galarian, sure. which is the way I've always considered it. So, Except they probably the still- land. Well, yes and no, because the there's the symbol yeah. of the leaf and everything else. So a lot of the material does actually indicate that Gosra does have some purview over the land as well. It's just not considered an aspect the way that the sky and the water are. Mm-hmm. So really so, strong ones. And the, yeah. you brought up an interesting point, Jason, because one of the things I was reading, too... The fact that Gozer is kind of confined to, well, it's not called the material plant, the universe now. <laughs> it made me wonder, I was like, do they have any sort of presence or, or um, sway over the plane of water or the plane of air? It's mm. a good question. And that, I, was something, I that, was, they, yeah, they that was something have, that I was, I was always curious about. But, yeah, that was something they I was have, curious about as I was reading. Yep, they have servitors that are um, mm-hmm. air and water elementals, which mm-hmm. are denizens of those planes, yeah. But I haven't really poked through Rage of Elements all that much. I don't know um, if there's anything in there that might indicate. Yeah, I, I also haven't actually had time to crack open Rage, so... But I do... I you know about those servitors especially the uh the one that hates dwarves for no reason at all <laughs> wow I, there's a lot of reasons to not like dwarves and i say that as somebody who wrote in high hell and too yeah so <laughs> jason jason don't dwarf daddy it's okay he didn't mean it he didn't mean it <laughs> it wasn't not everyone not everyone loves dwarves like you do <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, I can I could see uh, again it's just it's just Gozra's like indifference to so much is just such a, a wild concept to still embody as a as a deity and not just as a like and not just relegated to a philosophy, right? Like it does in uh in first edition there's the green faith, right? Which right. a lot of which is it's, gone. It, it, it's gone. It's yeah. still around, it's just different uh, yeah. than Tui, I think. But yeah, I mean, thinking about it, Gozra is just, I, you know, their physical body is the elements yeah. and the mm-hmm. weather and everything. And if you've ever been in the middle of a thunderstorm, do you feel like the thunderstorm gives a crap about yeah, you one way or the other? One. No, not one. And you know, at a deity level, that's almost what it is. Like I said yeah. before, it's human beings and humanoids are so beneath Gozra's notice. That unless you do something really heinous, probably if you get hit by a natural disaster, it's because Gozra didn't even know you were there. Yep. It it's rarely intentional unless you really did something to piss them. Yeah. Which has been known to happen. Yeah. Hmm. It does it does make me wonder, like just thinking about campaigns that have had like clerics of Gozra in it, like is there uh, at some point where they reach a high enough level that, you know, maybe other clerics would have a chance to commune directly with their deity and be like, oh, Iomade says, you know, pick up your sword. And it's like, well, duh, of course he says pick up your sword. But, like, what would Gozre tell a really high-level 
cleric of theirs uh, when they're out in the world. And it would probably be this exact same very thing. It's like, I, I don't really care what you do, but respect yeah. the sea and the sky lest we bring you ruin, right? Mm. Okay, I learned <laughs> that on day one. Thanks, buddy. People the good work. <laughs> in some ways, but I mean, that's why the alignment shark for them is so flexible too. Yeah. It's because Gozer doesn't really care about your ethical standpoint mm -hmm. provided that you're protecting nature itself and nature doesn't really care about your ethical standpoint either right. for the most part yeah yeah and gozra's gozra's allowed alignments matches up perfectly with the the classical first edition D, &D 3.5 druid allowed alignments where yeah you're just allowed that T access and none of the extremes on any of the corners. Mm -hmm. And I mean that that's got to be intentional from a design mm -hmm. perspective too. But I once I actually sat down, I kind of did a breakdown of the alignment of all of the core twenty deities, and it's it's interesting because there's nine alignments, which means that there are two alignments that get three deities instead of one. Lawful good is chaotic good, good, right? Lawful good and true neutral. Mm -hmm. Oh, true neutral. Okay. Yep. True neutral has Nethys, Phrasma, and Gozra. Right. I always forget that Nethys isn't lawful. Yep. Right. No, he's <laughs> way too crazy for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I did appreciate that they uh, in this in this one e write up called out and dave this is not to take away from from what you contributed to oh, no God's it's fine magic. i i i built off of great stuff that was there yeah i yeah. i can't stress that i you know both this and for the other article that i did in this book it you know i couldn't have done it without what was already there and i just tried to write what wasn't afterwards sure yeah it was i'm just repeating what other people yeah. wrote before me which is not good work yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. i i really appreciated this <clears throat> relations with other religions uh, paragraph that they tend to have uh, in these older write-ups as well where it's just yes, like... I've always enjoyed those. Yeah, indifferent, right? Unless they threaten the domain or existence, right? Like, of course fights with Abadar because too much civilization sometimes. Gets mm -hmm. along really well with Aristotle because Aristotle respects yep. nature. Respects nature, <laughs> yep. Hates Nethys and Rovagug, and it's just kind of like to put those two on the same line together is is a really funny thing because they just you know have the urge to destroy things, right? Right. And against Urgothoa for undead, right? Is okay but, with Desna, but jealous yeah. of her because travelers pray to her more than they pray to them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Like that. That was one thing I wanted to bring up is that there there was this. There is this thread that's been hinted at in in um, Inner Sea Gods, this one e, the the one e text, that they that there's this little tiny mentions here and there, is Gozra's jealousy. Oh, interesting. Like it's in that yeah. that line, and then there's a couple other lines earlier in the text too, where they mention about Gozra and jealousy, and that's like that was something that stuck out to me as I was reading it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, like well, it said in the uh, the intro paragraph, they're a fickle god. Yeah. Yep. And, and I think part of it, too, is they're one of the oldest gods. I think maybe Phrasma and some of the other weird ones that came from the universe before this time cycle, this turn of the wheel, to use a different fantasy genre mm -hmm. expression. <laughs> Gozer is probably the oldest after them because they are made up of the entirety of, again, the ecosystem of the planet. So, you know, to look at something relatively young, like we consider the three ascended gods to be the new kids on the block, but to Gozer, you know... Nethys is a fucking teenager who is burning down <laughs> half of the countryside. <laughs> and, you know, it's... I just think that's... It is interesting, kind of, the jealousy. I, I hadn't really picked up on that aspect, but it is there, and I think that kind of... 
pulls back as well to goes for sort of being very inspired by Poseidon and Zeus and that kind of energy. And it to feel jealousy is a very Greek deity thing. And mm-hmm. to strike out because of jealousy is a very, very Greek deity thing. So I think it's kind of wrapped up in some of that as well. Yeah, jealousy, is, jealousy is also a water, it is a very water-based like type of emotion because the, the water will just take everything. It doesn't, it won't give it back. You know, you have to work to get anything back that's underwater. So right. my, my little mind cannon, the little Mike mind cannon, that's terrifying, don't go in there. That's, that's that aspect of them is, is the water aspect, the capricious, the, the, you know, ah, if you want to be, you know, neutral evil, you can be neutral evil. It's kind of like the water thing, you know, water doesn't care if you're good, better, and different. Water will take you. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just, just a weird little, right. little bits of, uh, you yeah, can see it. And it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Because to that point, too, the water one is always the, the far more stylized one, the, the conventionally attractive one, the the one that's supposed to look alluring, while the sky aspect is always the angry aspect, usually, which is interesting. And water is also linked a lot with narcissism. You know, mm-hmm. specifically Narcissus mm-hmm. from Greek mythology as well, who just kind of catches a reflection of himself and goes, God, you're pretty, and stares at it until he dies. <laughs> <laughs> and then becomes a flower. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I absolutely took, a, as I was reading all of the articles today, absolutely made me think this is this is the closest deity that Galarian has to a classical Greek de- deity. Yeah. Like, none of the others are classical the way this one is classical. Yep. And it's pretty classically Greek. Yeah. But Blaine Meriden should just be a t-shirt everyone has, because that's what... You know. the, to, to echo back to, to something we talked about earlier about uh, Gozer just really not giving any fucks to normal conventions. One of the things I really like in the text as it reads here is that Gozer represents both male and female facets of life unconstrained by civilization's notions of masculinity and femininity, grandmother, grandfather, brother, sister, eternal and ever-changing, the wind and the waves echo and shape the countless living things on Galeri. Just... Even even your, your, your notions of gender, they don't give a shit. It's just like... Yeah, and... and- really where my head was at and trying to reinforce that in my text too was really so often when you talk about gender norms and everything the big proponents of trying to stay within gender lines say oh it's not natural to go outside of them yeah which is complete bs there are plenty of examples within the natural world where gender roles don't mean shit Mm -hmm. and (laughs) what i really wanted to do was take this deity that clearly didn't care about gender roles because they're both and neither at the exact same time and just kind of hammer that home as much as possible trying to find the actual text here because I do have one yep so in the two we write up it says grocers clergy and followers represent a wide variety of gender identities the dual natural nature of worshippers and the faith as, accepts all identities as part of the natural order. The church doesn't place an emphasis on marriage in particular, and seasonal trysts are as common among worshippers as unions that last for life. Mm-hmm. So the other thing I wanted to be like was marriage doesn't really matter. Um, mm-hmm. Polyamory is fine. Literally, you can find all of these things as examples inside of nature that are done with animals and everything else and Gozer thinks that's fine for humanoids too. Yeah. Yeah, I just, that was something that I took from the reading today too. I, the paragraph on marriage in the first edition source book was very similar to that of, you know, 
Yeah, the a lot of people join his the the Church of Gozra specifically because the Church of Gozra doesn't care who they love or how they love. And that might be a terrible reason to join a church, but then Gozra doesn't really care about that either. So right yeah, th yeah the, the line specifically ends with, though this attitude is actually more akin to indifference, as the bonds that, that humanoids make between their kind and the relationship roles they choose are irrelevant to the forces of nature. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, I, I, I doesn't... Whatever, uh, man. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you see my thunderstorm last week? Now that. <laughs> that I also don't care yeah. about because it already happened. It's way back there i got stuff coming up yeah 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 in terms of relationships the other thing that i like that i had forgotten i put in here was um some members even just remain celibate and isolated and just kind of wander away and hang out in sea caves or on the top of mountains yes and that they don't mind being alone because in order to exemplify a deity with dualistic aspects you're not alone if you're by yourself, which me as an introvert really kind of, I wanted to put that on the page. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember if there are other deity write-ups uh, in, in the game system, in the setting uh, that talk about a similar kind of hermitage approach to to life and i assume a rory would establish monasteries right but that's a bit yeah a, a little rory, different yeah a rory kind of seems focused on you know helping each other learn right you know there's a there's a master and pupil kind of feel to him mm. that i would think mm. wouldn't encourage solitude because you're supposed to there. keep passing perfection on to mm -hmm. to the next generation and Gozer is really you can just fuck off into yeah. whatever cave you want and uh, just ignore people because people fucking suck and I feel that very much yeah there was a there's a ritual that Serenites go through but it's mm -hmm. not like a permanent hermitage it's more of a here go to the top of the mountain and worship the sun alone for a month sure but uh, but but then you go then you return. Yeah, it's then, not like yeah you, know, you got to get back to to bringing the fire of serenade yeah. to the rest of and and everything. you know right. making right. sunflower seed bread for the poor. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. it is it's serenade Lent. You know. Yeah. 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 Basically. All right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, I'm also trying to think of deities that might have something similar but Me Nethys could probably get semi-isolationist sure yeah, I mean Nethys yeah. is for the basement dwelling nerds you know yeah yeah, the, yeah. I, I could see that <laughs> don't talk to me mom I'm, I'm in my demi plane you mean your Robogog. basement yeah oh, they'll say Robogog yeah Robogog Robogog sure yeah yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah out in the middle of nowhere just you know smashing stuff okay and Grotus I mean, yeah Grotus yeah Grotus probably yeah <laughs> <laughs> can see that I'm sure there's some yeah. imperial lords that would also you know require you to oh yeah take a well, pilgrimage I mean, to be alone that's but, yeah. yeah or, or, or the eye too yeah yeah I'd think master of secrets yeah. I'm just gonna take my Gap secrets and here just hang out in this cave yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Regathiel probably has a what do you start a family for? Go fight uh, devils and demons. Right. You're wasting your time being <laughs> a father. <laughs> My dad sucks. You would be bad at it too. <laughs> yeah. So what? one of the things I that I really like to learn about particularly as a GM is how deities appear and to their followers and here, one of the things is, though, even though we're really hammering home this idea that Gozer just really doesn't care and is indifferent, in the rare occasion where they actually do have any fucks to give to their followers, 
it does say that Gozra does show their favor by, in the most Gozra thing possible, a gentle breeze that carries with them mm. the scent of flowers. Mm -hmm. The appearance of large number of animals. The unexplained sound of waves crashing on a distant beach. And dreams of a specific recognizable animal. Again, we w this is the third deity that is fourth. The fourth deity that is including dreams as uh, messages. Mm. So this is a common thing that we're that I'm run running across. And um, this is probably also why um, there's might be a little bit of jealousy with uh, <laughs> Desna. Desna. Was just yeah. about to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Jason. I... <laughs> That could be part of it, but also I think that could be going back to basing it off of classical mythology, too, yeah. because dreams are where deities show up almost always yeah. um, in that kind of stuff. Mm. Mm. Unless you're Zeus, and then you show up in other ways. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> With your penis. <laughs> or as a rainstorm or a goose. You know, there's so many ways. This is a quick aside, but <laughs> anybody who hasn't read the uh, book Zeus Grants Stupid Wishes and is a fan of mythology, I highly recommend it. All right. It's written by a comedian who has never heard of any myth before in his entire life and does a deep dive into various cultures' myths and kind of reacts to them completely train of thought and tries to explain them to the audience as if they've never heard of it either. Amazing. And one of my favorite lines is he's talking about Kronos not wanting uh, his children. And the line is, this isn't what I ordered. I'm returning it to the baby store. <laughs> He also refers to Norse mythology as the religion for you if you want your two principal characters to be a ninja pirate wizard and what amounts to a beard with a hammer sticking out of it. Much. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. So Jason's good. PCs. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's the description of Thor if I've ever heard one. <laughs> yep. Pretty much. Yeah. I, uh, I, I do... There was a... Um, the, there's a section here in the first part, Jason, you were talking about the uh, ways Gozer appears to their followers and just some of the ideas of what their followers could do, out, could be doing out in the world. And one idea, of course, is like, oh, they're on ships, right? Like they get paid to be, you know, casting helpful spells and they go where they want, when they want. And if they don't want to get on your ship, they're not gonna because you can't really make them do it uh, <laughs> all that well. But I, I really liked one of the other things that the, this author highlighted was the idea that they would go to places where the world has been corrupted in some way. And so you might find a lot of them in the world wound mm -hmm. uh, actually participating in that, that crusade or in Numeria taking on, you know, radiation. An anti-radiation cleric of Gozre sounds like a pretty badass kind of a thing uh, yeah. to go out there and do, right? Like... But yeah, and then all these other uh, options that they could that they could be out there uh, doing too. But mostly just kind of like, a, oh man, like your fishery is dumping guts along the shore. Stop it, guys! I'm gonna clean this up. And then if you don't, if I have to keep cleaning it up, we're gonna have to talk. And by talk, I mean I you're gonna get your fishery it. down. Yeah, I burn your fishery <laughs> down, basically. Yeah, or I wash it into <laughs> the ocean. Yeah, it's like that one episode of Last Airbender with the painted lady. Yes, yes, exactly. So, one thing that Chosen Priests have been seen doing, uh, and I think this is book two of Hell's Rebels, is um, they hang out at the seashore just kind of naturally. So, what better kind of pastime than to be picking up all of the corpses from shipwrecks and everything that wash up on the shore and just giving them a nice proper burial for, mm. you know, pro bono and trying to inform family members if they can identify the bodies which i think is a pretty cool thing yeah i mm think -hmm. yeah yeah they i think um i think i read somewhere in the first edition text that sometimes they even find like babies who have survived shipwrecks and yeah and bring them to the church and raise them mm -hmm. yeah yeah 
because I, I remember in that or around that paragraph too, they they talk about like not a not an insistence on celibacy, but just as a kind of a general practice, they don't really that they, they aren't out there having a whole lot of their own children, uh, and so that that finding shipwreck kids that survive or kids that survive shipwreck is a a way that they like bring them in and uh, mm-hmm. start raising them up in their in their faith tradition and yeah I, I'd be that'd be a that would be a really interesting role playing opportunity to play like if you had I don't know one cleric being like the 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 cleric who found the kid and the other player is the kid right and their their relationship maybe the kid doesn't want to be a full blown cleric of Gozre but wants a to ranger play. yeah a ranger maybe or free archetype cleric or blessed one or something like that i don't know but uh yeah Yeah. remaster champion without the alignment attached yeah that'd be nice gotcha one of the things too that i really enjoyed was it says here and i'm just bringing this up because i thought it was funny zealous priests of gozra remain celibate to your point jason Mm -hmm. devoting all their energy to their deity These priests have been known to worship their deity naked in high places or in shallow water, a process referred to as becoming sky-clad or sea-clad. Yes. Yep. That is in the text. Yep. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) Uh, Skinny dipping for the god. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bible camp gets awesome. No. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah. No, but yeah, and Dave. I, th- I think you were about to say something about being on sh- having the the clerics out on ships or the no so out on ships. A yeah. big thing for me in any world that has magic that allows you to manipulate the weather or a propulsion system, I always go back to thinking, okay, how is this used for the everyday? Person? It's not everybody's going to be an adventure, and magic in a lot of these settings kind of replaces advanced technology. And so you apply magic to do things that advanced technology would do in a modern system. So it makes total sense that Gozrin clerics would be on ships. That's where they want to hang out. That's where they get the waves. That's where they get the wind. They get free room and board because they get the ship where it's supposed to go. The crew is so much better for it because they get to go wherever they're going. It's a big point in the Wheel of Time series, which is one of my favorite fantasy series of all time, and um, a couple other things too. And it's just, I love seeing it here uh, to the point where when I did a short campaign of Stolen Shackles, I did play a Tango Druid of Girls. Nice. Nice. That campaign did not live very long because our GM neglected to tell us that uh, the entire first book was basically a bunch of skill challenges in order to get people on your side. So we made combat-focused piracy characters yep. and couldn't talk our way out of a paper bag. So we <laughs> ended up starting the mutiny like 15 <laughs> sessions early and succeeded, but killed about half of the party. And we were like, oh, I think we're done. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. The um, As far as temples and shrines and worship services go... As you can imagine, from a deity who's fairly indifferent, there's not a whole lot of soup of structure to their to their temples and their church. I think the biggest the biggest constant is that their temples are always open to the sky and have some sort of a body of water present. Yeah. And that's about it. Pretty much going outside is constitutes going to Gazra's church. So, yeah. um, I mean, there's places that are more connected to Gazra than others, like the seashore on the sea itself, or the highest mountain you can get to be as close to the sky as possible. But, I mean, for the most part, it's you know similar to others like Kid and Kaylin, where anything that's serviceable and mildly adjacent is good enough. You don't need something with Abadar where you got gilded halls and gold columns going up eight stories or whatever the hell he has in his banks. Right. <laughs> yeah. I actually, so 
I am running a new Rise of the Rune Lords campaign right now. Jason is one of my players. And I spent a ridiculous amount of time, way too much time, doing a full battle map of the Sandpoint Cathedral. And part of the Sandpoint Cathedral is that it's six different wings dedicated to six different deities. One of the deities is Gozra, and that presented me the challenge of how do I have a a Gozra wing in an indoor temple? Because very specifically, it in all of the write-ups, it mentions that their shrines are always open to the sky mm. and typically have a pool. So what I decided was there is a hole in the ceiling of this portion of Sandpoint Cathedral that is right over a basin of rainwater, essentially. Mm -hmm. And this wing of the temple is actually dug into the ground a couple of feet so that when the basin spills over, it doesn't flood the rest of the temple. Nice. Right. Nice. Makes sense. <laughs> I believe there's also a ghost room temple in book one of Extinction Curse. Mm -hmm. uh, the show must go on by Jason yeah. Andro. Um, I know mm -hmm. uh, he mentioned somewhere on a while back that he took deep into the Ghost Room articles to write it. Um, I haven't played that one myself, but I understand it's pretty cool and it's a pretty well thought out Ghost Room temple with a lot of stuff in it. Yeah, yeah, I, I ran that. I ran that AP as a GM. Um, it's a really sweet little mini dungeon. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a, a, the Hermitage. Nice. Corey, I like the idea that as you decided on a, a hole in the ceiling there, the maybe the idea that it has always resisted every repair attempt, no matter how many times they try to patch it, that hole just, it just keeps busting over and over and over again. So eventually they're just like, <laughs> clearly we need to leave this need to leave this hole <laughs> right so sorry about the draft everyone but uh <laughs> the, in the winter yeah oh. mm. luckily sandpoint is like northern california right so <laughs> it gets cool but not cold hmm. yeah <laughs> I, I do like that in one of the other in one of the write-ups it talks about how there's a there is a triangle of standing stones that is a typical arrangement for Gozre places of worship, including one in the land of Linorm kings that's uh, composed of blocks of ice rather than stones. And I think that that's a that sounds like a really cool place to to visit and have a really um, uh, you know like a like a I don't know a battle on the solstice against some ice monsters or something that, that sounds like a that really would be cool cinematic yeah. setting yeah i love a good detail from led to the Lenar kings yes mm -hmm. yeah, yeah giant blocks of ice that's sweet it's like the you know that one series with that big wall made of ice but instead of a whole wall it's just it's like stonehenge but ice and bigger i don't know yeah how tall would you make them i wonder mm -hmm. They're like 30 foot tall. Probably. Just dreaming now. Yeah. But, well, then uh, that brings me to the, uh, the little detail of how statues of Gozra are, mm. are built. When people make statues of them, they tend to use driftwood or... Mm -hmm burned forest logs from lightning strikes very rarely they use stone uh, mm -hmm. because they see the working of stone or the creation of metal to be a sign of civilization that is more anathema to their deity but sometimes in the far north, the statues are made of blocks of ice. 
Nice. And sometimes are magically enchanted so that they don't melt. But that's, uh, that's one of the rare forms of statue that you can find of Gozra. And a lot of the times, the statues of Gozra are a lot more abstract. Like, sometimes they're just two pieces of driftwood that are kind of humanoid shape. Yeah. You know what kind of statue of Gozra I would love to see is maybe down in, like, uh, Syrian or Thubia is um, a giant pillar of sand that's been uh, fulminated and calcified by a lightning strike. Ooh, Ooh, yeah. Oh, I like that. That'd I like amazing. that a lot. That that just happens to be in the vague shape of Gozra because it's a, it's a divine mark that they place down there for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, that's sweet. I, I got to slip that in somewhere. I just had that idea. <laughs> Venture ideas. There you go. That is, that, yeah, that's really sweet. I was going to make a dumb joke about being in Minnesota and having ice sculptures, but that's... Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's a that's a way better <laughs> tangent than I was going to make with a dumb joke. Well, in, in Lost Thumbs Gods of Magic, too, the, um, the art for the one goes written statue that they give... Is actually one down from the Malangi Spams. And yeah, mm -hmm. that's really more cool. like kind of, it's almost a dualistic African uh, fertility totem. Almost. Yeah. Almost like As, a Zulu mask. Yeah. Which is really mm -hmm. neat. And, and there's a bunch of details about Gazra in the uh, in the Malangi Spams, too. There are really big gaiety down there, probably because of the sod plants. Which, you know, kind of makes me wonder about the Eye of Nego and how Gelser actually feels about that. Ooh. Because, I mean, it's doing all of the stuff that Gozer loves, but it's not really a natural weather phenomenon. Right. So yeah. is that something that they're okay with or something that they would want their trees to be stopping? Great question. Some adventure hooks for folks that like to write their own stuff at home there too. Yeah. I I um, homebrewed a bit of a bit of a backstory to that for my podcast for the eye. Yeah, that um, I'll get to at some point. I'll get to at some point. Well, yeah. Well, there's some good stuff in uh, Lost Omens Travel Guide that I did for the rare events section uh, too. As so I continue to plug my work, but. <laughs> oh, go ahead. You know, it's it's all kind of tied together. Like, I, I get ideas when I'm writing one thing, and I know I can't fit them in. And then I just kind of try and slip them in somewhere else. So in the rare events section, there's a thing that people do uh, in the Sodden Lands where they basically can dodge lightning on this one beach and just hope it doesn't kill them. Oh, there it is. Yeah, the lightning dance, event three. <laughs> oh, nice. Yes. Sounds good. So, did we get to point our allies yet, or no? Yeah, one, one a little. One one quick thing is, sure. as far as the, cert, the church being fairly decentralized, there is some one point where there is a bit, at least it feels like, there is a bit of structure, and that's when there is a high priest that passes away. Yes. And the contention and the competition for the rank of high priests I, and, the, and the ceremony that happens. Yeah. I loved that part of the write-up. That was just phenomenal. Like, this idea that, like, that they would bother, like, yeah, uh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm... Just, voicing my no. enthusiasm at this point. No, no, yeah. that's that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what the so, show is for, Jason. <laughs> so it says here, and I'll just read this uh, real quick verbatim, that in rugged coastal regions, claimants might dive naked from tall ocean cliffs and swim to shore, with the first to return becoming the new high priest. In river yes, settlements or, and along gentler coasts, retrieving heavy stones from the ocean or riverbed is a common test. In woodland regions, hopefuls might climb as far up to a forest's tallest tree as they dare and throw themselves off. 
and the person who falls the farthest and yet survives is declared the new high priest. In harsher climates, he would-be successors must make harrowing treks and brave the dangers of the elements. Those who endure prove their commitment to the faith, more, a more important quality than their deity's unpredictable favor. It's just these... Yeah. I See, now I want to just play a, a cleric of Gozer who's just a total bro, right? Yes. The, and like, just, just like... Just, they're just like crushing beer cans on like their heads. X Games, kind of like in X, X Games. Games. Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. They've got they like invented surfing on Galarian, you know, kind of a, not invented, but like you know, got really into it, maybe, or and tried to do that same activity on every surface they could visit in the entire planet. <laughs> yeah, and thus did invent snowboarding. And invented snowboarding in the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I just like the idea of who's going to be our next high priest can be solved with a polar plunge. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have done yeah. that. I guess that means that I am worthy. Yeah. Well, Made it's, it. it's always funny to me. Uh, you know, whenever I hear contests like that, I always kind of think back to um, there's an old Gundam anime where, like, every 10 years they hold a Gundam fighting tournament between all of the nations of the world, and whoever wins gets to rule Earth for 10 years. And I'm like, this feels like a pretty lousy way to figure out who's that's, going to have your best leadership qualities. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's the plot of Mortal Kombat? <laughs> I was thinking G Gundam. Yeah. But, yeah. The yeah, second that, best of the Gundams. Amazing. <laughs> oh. Who's going to yeah. rule Earth Realm? This is uh, from all the best fighters are from Earth. Yeah. <laughs> so you wanted to talk about planar allies, Dave. I was just wondering if it came up. But what I really want to talk about is aphorisms. We'll get to that. Yeah, because mm. <laughs> we got we have holy texts and holidays and aphorisms, and I think uh, that. And then, yeah, planar allies, and I think that'll be... And only... boons. Oh, yes, yes, boons and boons and curses. Oh, those are fun to write. Oh, I'm dead. Yeah, I, get, I imagine. Yeah. So, Corey, you already went a little bit over the holy texts. Yeah. At the beginning. Yeah. So, Gozo's holy text is just a, a collection of... Uh, of rules and prayers on how to respect nature. Uh, it's called Hymns to the Wind and the Waves. And the neat thing about it from from the text is it varies based on locality. Like, if you're an Osirian and you're, you're worshipping Gozra, you don't really need to know how to survive blizzards you need to know how to survive sandstorms so your version of mm. the hymn will have tips on how to survive sandstorms and how to prepare for things like that whereas in the land of the Linorm kings it will absolutely have okay this is what you do when a blizzard hits you with six feet of snow in one day so how do you heal frostbite yeah yeah, so it's very much a no two versions of the text are ever going to be the same because no two localities deal with the same weather patterns and the same environmental hazards. Right, and I think it also, you know, no two locations are going to have the same prescribements on how to maintain nature. That's why, mm -hmm. you know, it's... Yep. You're not going to have notes on you know, why to keep dandelions out in Thuvia, but you are going to need it up in Taldor because dandelions are in fact an invasive species and a weed, and yeah. they disrupt the natural order, and they kill the local plants, so you know, a cleric of Gozra would be real into gardening, and actually get rid of all of the crawling ivy and other crap that you need to deal with that just gets everywhere and chokes out the other plant life yeah, I, I, I I really like that idea too that they each like this this idea this holy text 
really spoke to me as, you know, kind of the, almost like a first aid manual um, of sorts to how to survive the, like these different areas, these different regions. At least that's how I interpreted it when I was reading it. And right. that, for some reason, that really, that really hit me. It's like, oh, that's really friggin' cool. And it's just like, here, you know, in the Mwangi Expanse, how are you going to deal with, like, foot fungus? You know? Because, like, it's really fucking humid there. And yeah. you're going to have to deal with fungus, like foot fungus and mold. And you're not going to really have to deal with that in Osirian. Mm. Yeah. I, I will yeah. say there is one dandelion who is allowed to be in Taldor, and that is Fluff Bang, the uh, dandelion blade. Yeah, but that is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really appreciate that they also call out the variety of surfaces that these holy texts can be written on as well. Like, mm -hmm. you're not going to bother with paper in the sodden lands because how long they're out, how long is that going to around? Yeah, <laughs> this is gonna, it's going away very quickly. Yeah. yeah. But also, you have to destroy a tree in order to create paper. Which also, the mm -hmm. cleric yeah. of Ghost Road would not typically be a fan of. Right. Yeah. So, so here you here's the hymn. Yeah. This is this this twenty foot long, three hundred pound piece of driftwood contains the hymn. We carry it <laughs> from here to there when we do our when we do our things. Yeah. So just we just rode on that with some some charcoal from that tree that got struck by lightning over yeah. there. So we just got to keep rewriting portions every now and then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why not? Why not? It's <laughs> it would make the most sense. Totally. And you brought this up earlier, Jason, about the equinox. Mm. And, and um, I thought we were going to segue into that, but that happens to be one of the holy high holy days for Gazrins. Mm -hmm. yeah. Specifically, equinox. the vernal equinox. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, get ready for planting. Get ready for things to grow. Yeah. yeah. Both of Gozra's mentioned holidays are around the spring and watching things grow, but the Vernal Equinox specifically is known as uh, First Bloom, and it's seen as the start of the planting season. And I think that makes sense, too, because... I know we say that Gozer is an enemy of Nephis, but at the same time, they have a lot in common with Nephis. Their aspect of duality and their association with creation and destruction at the same time in almost equal measure. So, you know, Gozer gets wrathful, destroys a whole swath of land, or kills a bunch of people, but there's also creation to You know, the sea is always teeming with life, the wind brings along rain clouds, which cause trees to grow. It's it makes total sense to me that one of their biggest things would be renewal and rebirth, because they're a deity that functions in cycles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, forest fires bring new forests. Mm -hmm. Yep, Dave, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, again, kind of getting back to that idea of Gozra's jealousy people and like seeing Nethys as you said this upstart teenager that's burning things down right and yeah. you could just see Gozer being like you come into my house with this <laughs> creation and destruction business that is my thing that I do but you do it with magic instead of just letting the weather do it no yeah I just kind of thinking about Nethys as a teenager it's just so I have great. an image of him listening to My Chemical Romance throw a fireball <laughs> off the right string and it's not a phase, mom. You would. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to be stuck with that image now as Neth Nethys as, well, as like a teen. <laughs> well, and that really fits the the art that Jason shared in one of our shared discords yes. just the other day of a Nethan priest that is just covered with half of their body in tattoos. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, my typical it, romance you, all the way. Yeah. yeah. Can you think of a more emo core thing than that? I mean, yeah. it's he might as well uh, be creating scroll staffs and listening yes. to Black Parade. Like, yes. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So the other holiday of Gozra is Currency Eve, which is a day-long fast in preparation of the first sprouts of the year. And it is held on the 7th of Gozrin, uh, which is the, the month, of course, named after Gozra. And fittingly, it corresponds with our April when plants are starting to bloom and come into to fruit. And so it really makes sense to have it then. Mm -hmm. And if April showers bring Mayflowers, what do Mayflowers bring? Pilgrims. Thank you. <laughs> Someone knows my dad jokes. <laughs> I like how we talked about the idea of Saren Ray having Lent, and this currency sounds a lot like Gozrin Ash Wednesday. Yeah. It's even the right time of year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody, stop eating. We're going to plant <laughs> food tomorrow. <laughs> Why are we eating? I don't know. But really, just don't do it. <laughs> I was supposed to have one Kay Kaylian holiday where you just get drunk. Drink. Yeah. Just, just drink absolutely shit faced all day. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that every Kaden Kaylian holiday? No. No, that one's special. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the time it's just praying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Most days with Kaden Kaylian you want to be pleasantly drunk. That one is the you regret your life the more you <laughs> have. <laughs> Amazing. All right. So aphorisms. Yeah, you wanted to talk about aphorisms, Dave, and I, I will. I will say that it. I, I appreciate you, because one of my least favorite things to find in Gods and Magic, the Lost Omens version of the book, is a repeated aphorism from Inner Sea Gods, and you didn't do that. I, I appreciate. They tried to avoid those. Nice. I. Uh, you know, I thought that I would be doing a disservice on my first uh, assignment if I repeated it on single word uh, from previous text, so I tried real <laughs> hard. But the, if we're jumping right to the Lost Omens aphorisms, uh, it does contain probably favorite, my most favorite thing I have ever written. Mm. So as somebody who struggles a lot with mental health, anxiety, and depression, um, mm -hmm. I saw a bit of an opportunity to get back on the page and so there's an aphorism in here that says, A storm also passes. Mm -hmm. And dark as the skies can turn, weather and emotion are both temporary. Life continues, event after event, and while lasting impressions are made, the clouds will eventually clear. Flowers of Gozra use this as a mantra or common advice to those who come to them in despair. And that's something I think about a lot, is... It, it might be storming now. The sun will come out eventually. Uh, there, there's always a tomorrow, basically. Mm. Just phrased in a weather way for Gozra. And I mean, not to give myself too much credit, but I personally go back to that passage every so often to reread it if I'm having a tough time. Um, and I've been told by other people that they do as well, which is just amazing to hear. Mm. Yeah. yeah, no, that was one of written. my favorite aphorisms from for Gozra. Yeah. Like, it absolutely hit home, and it was really well done, and really, really defined the deity as well as providing sage advice, which I think aphorisms should do in a lot of cases. Right. So. And I really wanted to put in, like, a a positive caring aspect into at least one of the aphorisms as well because as we've covered Gozra typically doesn't give a crap about you but there's <laughs> parts of nature that are calming and do care for you and do help mm. uh -huh. cats are a very good example of that in my opinion so you know nature provides helpful things as well as it screws you up and I did kind of want to try to make that clear throughout some of these entries, and that's why I included that one in particular. I really need to have an aphorism that had something nice to say. Mm. Well, not, yeah, not only that, it's just like aphorisms generally are um, a humanoid construct. It's something that 
right. the, a, a priest or priestess of Gozra would have said at one point in time, and humans being social creatures or humanoids being social creatures, they they would want to provide comfort. So it makes sense that you know a follower of Gozra would want to calm or comfort and somebody else. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. My other favorite actually comes from the the other book. Yep. At least I think it came from the other book. Let me double check. Yes. <laughs> uh, and that was uh, The Last Gasp of the Sky, Dark Blood of the Sea. Mm. Which is, yeah, that's a good one. A, which is a dual aphorism for a dual god. But it it's the other side of the the caring coin that you you threw out with yours in that this is the no nature is going to reclaim you for your sins against it eat shit and die <laughs> right after and yeah. like <laughs> and the other thing i think you know when i think about aphorisms for davies is uh can i fit this into the verbal components of casting a divine spell and this mm. and it's and short enough. Usually, I want those to hang around somewhere too, and that's a really good example of one. Right before you're going to cast fireball or tidal wave or <laughs> lightning bolt. Yeah, and I I know verbal components are going away too, but you still need spell incantations, and uh, ah, aphorisms are a great way to grab them. Yeah, no, I never thought of ath- aphorisms in that context, but I really like that, and I'm going to steal that for my clerics. It's a good one. Yeah, Storm also passes as a great incan- incantation for heal. Yeah. For sure. Or restoration. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like, I like this aphorism. Storm and salt. Just yelling yeah. it like yeah, yeah yeah just the common exclamation yeah yeah whether <laughs> for good or for bad just yeah you always need a good what the fuck was that yeah uh, exactly. but, but, <laughs> uh which um caden's got the great one of sweet barley brew which uh that one's so good yeah but uh yeah i I love a good aphorism, and uh, the Lost Omens ones are full of some really good ones mm-hmm. that I really appreciate. The one I love for Gorham is Blood Not Rust, mm-hmm. uh, which just epitomizes them so well. <laughs> yeah. uh, my my favorite aphorism is um, and me being a me being a lover of dwarves it shouldn't be a surprise. Is hops and water is not beer. <laughs> for Torag. Yeah. Right. Just 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 because you put two and two together does not make it four. Yeah. Uh, my favorite aphorism is the one that I created for my my uh Desnan cleric. And that is Grotus looms, mm-hmm. but only where the stars do not shine. <laughs> uh, nice. every time I think of Grotus, I just think of that moon from Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Yes. Yes. Yep. That, that's <laughs> literally time. all I can see. I know he's actually even more imposing than that, but yep. that's all I can envision in my mind. <laughs> but the the other aphorisms for Gozra from the, the two books are drink deep and think fast, which is the Gozra equivalent of make the best of what you have. You never know what's what's coming your way so live in the moment and make make do and then the by the tide in the tempest which was one of your attributions uh dave yeah that's that's one that that's the one i wanted for uh being able to fit it into some or verbal components and have it be a blast spell so um, I didn't want to copy exactly what was in Inner Sea Gods, of course, so I tried to do something that was similar, but not quite the same. And then, I'll be Awesome. And then, I think we just have the 
Allies are boost. Yeah. So, boons and curses typically open this with the the obedience from inner sea gods, which is hang a set of chimes where they will be stirred by either the wind or the water. If no suitable location exists to hang the chimes, you can hold them and shake them gently to sound throughout your obedience. Chant prayers from the hymns to the wind and the waves as you attune yourself to the sound of the chimes and then drink a mouthful of pure water and pour a handful over your head. So, one of the That's... simplest of the... Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. What does that get you mechanically is the question. What it gives you mechanically was a plus four bonus... I like that it's Gozer reminding us to hydrate, stay yep. clean. <laughs> exactly. Plus four sacred or profane bonus on savings throws against electricity and water spells. That's significant. It's not bad. <laughs> I just remember those obediences were, uh, they were very good and flavorful, but the mechanical bonuses they gave you were such a crapshoot. Some of them were like, <laughs> the strongest thing you could possibly have. The one for Phrasma was like a plus two on all knife attacks. So you had so many Phrasma rogues just running around. <laughs> Did Blade Sage Pathfinder one? No. Amazing. Because her obedience was really easy too, if I remember. Her, but then some of them were like, you must stop at um, an inn, but it must be the third inn on a Friday. Uh, that uh, means at the end of the month and like some really yeah. hang hoops to jump through for no benefit really that would ever come up funny the this uh, the obedience gives me gives me a, a real like catholic mass vibe mm. where, you, yeah. where you're ringing the chime and then you're like yeah you're doing a baptizing yourself again exactly yeah yeah it's it's also got a feel of um of the church of the drowned god from the Book yes. series that mm -hmm. it's not Wheel of Time. But, uh, yeah. At it's, least with that one, you're drinking pure water and not forced to drink salt, salt water. water. Yeah. 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 With, yeah. I mean, the equivalence of that ritual was you're basically waterboarded in the middle of the sea. Yeah. So, I mean, thank you, George. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you? I guess. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, it's a question <laughs> mark on that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the the boons and curses for or blessings and curses rather for Gozra. Oh yeah. And you know we we've talked that you're more likely to get get their ire than their blessing, but their blessings are pretty all right. Grants their guidance while you're at sea. You're under the constant effects of no direction and trained in sailing lore. Yeah, that's it's not a minor blessing. That's it's not, not bad if you're a shipborn. That that's not bad. And you yeah. know, the way I kind of figured it is, if you're going to do stuff that's making girls for happy, you're probably playing seafaring campaign anyway. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the moderate blessing is you gain the touch of the sea, which gives you water breathing and a swim speed equal to your land speed holy shit yeah. that's that's great pretty huge <laughs> yeah that's great. again great for a water campaign <laughs> yeah i think that um that might be a little mechanically overtuned but again these divine intercessions are not really they should be something that yeah. can be grabbed i mean this is your gm doing you a favor so you know, the, this is the your GM saying you played a really good cleric for most of this campaign. Here you go. Yep. And then the major blessing, if we want to talk overtuned, the major blessing is that you are blessed with the wind in your stride. You gain a 30 foot status bonus to all of your speeds, and you gain a fly speed equal to your land speed. Yeah. As stated, though, Gazara is a fickle deity, so if you can hold on to your major blessing for long enough to get a significant amount of use out of it, 
good for you, but yeah. they're probably <laughs> going to either forget about you or you're going to do something else to piss them off, and they'll take that away pretty quick. And then the curses. The minor curse. I love this one. Yeah. Is... Lightning begins to strike twice. You gain weakness 5 to electricity, and any natural or magical bolts of lightning always target you rather than the creatures around you. Ooh. So, yep. so that so that bad. wizard you're facing with electric arc is always hitting you first. Exactly. Oof. It's, I, I thought that would be fun. It's a very god is clearly pissed at you kind of uh, curse. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, uh, moderate curse is the current of the waves constantly fights against you, uh, putting you at risk of drowning any time you must swim. You lose any swim speed you have unless it's your only speed, in which case you take a minus 20 foot status penalty to it. When you roll an athletics check to swim, you always use the outcome one degree worse than the result. Oh, yep. You yeah. ate a devil fruit, and now you're paying for it. Uh, for any <laughs> One Piece fans out there, uh, that's about it. Yeah, uh, and then that's uh, right. the major curse is uh, those oh, yeah. these Gozra are shunned by nature itself. All animals and non-savient plants are hostile to you, and any animal companion or familiar that you have abandons you. Sapient plant's attitude towards you begins two categories worse than normal, as something about you seems repugnant. While plants and animals might not attack you outright, if it's not normally within their nature to do so when they are hostile, dogs growl at you, cats hiss, and so on. I love it. Yeah. Nature just despises me. And I've met people who are like that, where for whatever reason, <laughs> animals just do not care for them. Something about them is wrong. Literally every dog they pass on the street barks at them. Yeah. No cat will go near them. And listeners, that's the kind of person you should not trust. Uh, animals have a very good sense. And uh, if animals universally despise somebody, they're not someone you should be around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Pretty much. Yeah, I, I love the blessings and curses in Gods and Magic. They are just fun and flavorful. Yep. They were super fun to write. And the other thing that was kind of stressed is in Gods and Magic as well is uh, those are suggestions. They're not the only curses you can have. Yeah. So if you can come up with a better idea to torture somebody who decided to drown a sack full of kittens or whatever they did to take off those ropes, have at it. Yeah. We we had a we had a character get cursed by Abadar in our Age of Ashes game. He's a cleric of the Lantern King and tried to steal from the temple of Abadar. No, oh, you don't do that. <laughs> so and uh got cursed with the curse that writes your crime on your skin for everyone to see. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh. And, unfortunately, Mike isn't here to do Planar Allies. This is his favorite part. Mm, yeah. But, we can go through it, <laughs> because there are some really fun ones. Hey, sure. So, yeah, the first one is Hargul, which is a unique air elemental. <laughs> easily distracted. It's an easily distracted air elemental, only one of a few serving Gozra. Looks like a dark storm cloud with flickering lightning. For eyes, it is equally comfortable high in the air or deep in the sea, where it becomes a roiling mass of bubbles. <laughs> it strongly dislikes dwarves offerings of metal, and speakers who take too long to get to the point, but likes potions, especially potions of haste, exotic incense, and the fresh blood of those who despoil nature. This is the most ADHD uh, era on the really I've ever heard of, and I love it. <laughs> I mean, 
let's be honest. So I can only imagine that the sensation of being an air elemental is you can feel everything around you and everything as part of your being. How yeah. can you not have your attention pulled in 80 different directions? Yeah. Which is another thing that uh, we didn't touch on it too much, but I did bring that up in the Gosar article that I wrote as well. Mm. It's like Gosar is experiencing everything in the world at the same time. Yeah. Which is why their attention seems to be so split and they almost never actually go to anybody or appear to anyone specifically is because there's just too damn much happening. Yeah. And that's why they're so flighty. And I love that for air elementals as well. Like hyperactive air elementals just wonderful yeah <laughs> like the, i just what? love the the very random hates dwarves yeah. just nope don't like that well so i think it's because dwarves are heavily associated with the earth and yeah there's the opposite yeah. elements of earth and yeah it, um, that's yeah. probably what it is <laughs> and speakers should take game. too long to get to the point yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh man! Out with it, man! Just sit, just say I got day sister. Never mind, I'm off. Yeah, yeah. They they would not like my father. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, yep. Just thanks, Bob. Just yep. what what'd you call me for? <laughs> so, oh gosh, Hargle and a Minnesota goodbye. Oh god. <laughs> it, it wouldn't even wait. It'd just be gone. It'd yep. just be gone. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I prefer the Tokyo. They do the ball. Irish goodbye. <laughs> well, yep, out the yeah, door. Yeah. Well, Hargill does the Irish goodbye rather than the Minnesota goodbye. Just gone. Yeah, yeah. Gone. yeah. 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 Don't even realize they're but they're gone. Just like, where did Hargill go? Just pulls it back and it disappears out of the conversation. <laughs> <and crap. laughs> True. And then there is. Raz Tesh, who is an icy dragonfly like creature. And my favorite part of Raz Tesh's little write up was they they have a habit of asking inappropriate questions about humanoid at Nat. <laughs> uh, I mean that sounds legit. <laughs> yeah. And why do you have they that? love to eat gibbering mouthers. That yes. that's their favorite Dallas delicacy on Galarian is oh man that mass of eyeballs and mouths <laughs> I mean it probably just tastes like jello right <laughs> Jim Jiggler just thinking about it Fibbering <laughs> Mouthers have killed more PCs in my games than any other creature I've killed more PCs with gibbering mouthers than any other creature I can't believe it yeah, the, they, their engulf ability is yeah, yeah. real strong. And they are a low-level creature, which makes yeah. them yeah. them absolutely deadly. They're usually the first super killer thing that a party will play, yeah. And then uh, there's Saltbeard, yep. who is mm -hmm. your angry dour triton cleric. And uh, his favorite pastime is to trap ships in blocks of ice and then beat up on the land lovers who are trying to free their ships <laughs> from the flock of ice that he just encased it in. Right, and as I mean a, a ship killed his wife and orphaned all of his daughters. Must have. Uh, it's a little mermaid reference for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> he, I, I love that the fact that they actually called out that he has a foul mouth and even fouler breath. Yes. And hot oh, rum sure. is his favorite drink. Like, <laughs> what a sailor. Yeah. 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 I mean, how else do you get the hot rum if you don't trap sailors and then murder them? <laughs> yes. yeah. 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 Burn their ship and warm up the rum. He's a peasy. So. Melts the ice at the same time. There we go. <laughs> <That's Yeah. Jared. laughs> And then last but not least is Gozra's Gozra's Herald, Herald, which is the personification of Yuri. And ooh, ooh, it ooh. is it is an ancient air elemental 
a fusion of wind and wave and uh just a rolling black and blue cloud of utter anger and like just also lives on the material plane and pretty much does what he wants yeah it it's fun looking up the the stats for that for personification of Fury are in the back of the Serpent Skull volume that has the uh, mm -hmm. has oh, the yeah. the Gozera right up in it, and it's it's interesting because while it, one of the things it says is that while Gozer is both male and female, and you know in between and everything, right? Uh, personification of Fury is specifically it, not he or she or any mm -hmm. other. Yeah any of the pronouns uh, there too. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would think of it because the personification of Fury is probably just goes for a strip of any humanoid aspects that they possess. Yeah. Fair. Fair, fair, fair. I do... I, I like how... All that's left is the rage. Yeah. I like how in the write-up too, it's, they specifically talk about how elemental lords are always trying to court the personification yes. of fury mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. join them as yeah. a general yeah mm -hmm. and yeah, they're yeah. just like nope no nope. i don't want anything to do with you yeah hard fast yeah hey, i got stuff to do like <laughs> blow people up for disrespecting nature i, I got a rage man yeah i got a rage <laughs> and if you want if you want somewhere to find this stat block that isn't Serpent Skull. It is a, because yeah. individual I, AP volumes can be a little hard to come by. Sure. All of the heralds are actually also statted up in the back of Inner Sea Gods. Mm -hmm. So you can also find them there. Mm -hmm. On that note, I'll point out, because I don't think a lot of people know this, but you did Torag a little bit ago. Torag's herald, the Grand Defender, got two E stats in Lost Omens High Helm. Oh, is that the first herald to get actual stats in a 2e book? I'm not quite sure. Because I know but, there's uh, a summon herald spell. Yeah. That doesn't really actually give you stats. Not the same thing. Right, exactly. Anyway, Jason, ask me how I know that it's in that book. How do you know that it's in the book? Because I wrote it. <laughs> I thought maybe. <laughs> that one right there. There it is. There it is. What's yeah. really cool about the Grand Herald is it could pop into any suitable dwarf statue. It's just a wandering spirit that shows up wherever <laughs> it needs to be. Yeah. Level 15 creature. Yeah. yeah. All of the Heralds were level 15 in uh, yep. F101, yep. so uh, yeah. I think I want to keep that in two. That's fun. That makes sense. Although, uh, I think Galfrey was higher level than that when she ascended to Herald. Probably, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Norgorber's The Savvy Beast has been written up in Pathfinder 2. It shows oh. up in uh, one of the APs. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say which, because I think it might be a spoiler. <laughs> but that, that, that one exists. Yeah. Okay. As in two E stats. I love uh Good. that one... gives me somewhere to look for uh <laughs> for statting up heralds for my Wrath of the Righteous game. Nice. Yeah. From the from the one E stat block, I love the ability Storm Spirit, where personification of fury can merge with an unattended object of large, huge, or gargantuan size and give it life as an animated object. And yep. I love the idea of this spirit, like, flying into a boat or a ship and just being like, all right, now we're killing people as a ship instead of with <laughs> lightning bolts. So, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would imagine it's kind of like a Kraken attack, except the uh, planks of the ship come up at you. Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, tentacles. <laughs> That'd be terrifying. It really would. It really would. Now I can actually write stats for Davy Jones. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, in my in my game, Besmar's Herald is Davy Jones. Excellent. Oh, fantastic! Great choice. Yep. Uh, did you get uh, Del Nahi to uh, voice someone of yours? 
No, <laughs> but e but um, our buddy Eek does a pretty good job. Okay. Mm -hmm. He does a pretty good. He's no Bill Nye, but pretty good. Close enough. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think that's about it because I don't mm -hmm. think we have a whole lot of spoilers on Gozra. Not really nope. super present in yeah. APEs or adventures. No. Uh, Gozra's around, but they never really kind of um, form major plot points. Um, yeah. There's, yeah. Uh, there's Gozra and Temple in Extinction Curse, as we mentioned. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure there's a neutral evil inquisitor of Gozra in uh, Reign of Winter somewhere in the early half. Come on. I'll okay. keep an eye out for that because I am currently playing in that. Yeah. I, I think she runs like a bunch of, like a flock of ravens or something uh, nice. for one of the Eurasian witches. I can't remember. Um, and there's one in Serpent Stall as well. Yep. But, uh, yeah. Oh, I House Rebels, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're finding out that a lot of these super powerful major, major deities like Phorasma and Gozra just really are just, they're way too big and powerful to have real big well, plot so, points in yeah, adventures. I, I always kind of think of it like this. Um, there's a moment in Marvel Comics where uh, Doctor Strange sits down uh, Professor X and Maggie and Doctor Strange explains what his job is and he says so I'm dealing with all of these threats and they're giants and they would absolutely crush and destroy you and the reason you've never heard of them is because I'm very good at my job so the reason that I don't come to help you or the Avengers against something like Dr. Doom that you all can handle is because I'm busy dealing with the stuff that you can't even look at without going crazy. And mm. I kind of feel that that's sort of how the Galarian deities are doing it too. Mm. They're probably operating at such a high level that anything that's happening on the planet is uh, a passing mention in page 8 of their newspaper. Yeah. Essentially. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, there, there's big stuff, and they lend explicit hands now and again, but that's a lot better to do in the lore, because you want the PCs to be a hero, it's not the yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right. Anything else? Any last closing comments? Corey? Uh, I think I'm good. Dave? Dave, do you know who's dying next year? I do not. Okay. And then that is the truth. That's not even... I'm He's not even a dodge. I have no idea. I have personal opinions. I, I think we all do. I have preferences. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I Putting do not... Putting in requests. Yeah. yeah, I do not have... Um, I think the biggest money right now that I've seen online is that it's Torag. Uh, just because Luis has been dropping a lot of hints about Torag going away somehow. Me personally, I think it would be neat if Arasni murdered Iomade just to get rid of the last stain of Aradin because she has a real big grudge against him. As much as I love Iomade, I love that idea as well. Yeah. And then Arasni kind of takes that spot in the 20, uh, though that would kind of leave us champion god but I mean I kind of feel like Iomide exists specifically to be the god of paladins and not much else and with mm -hmm. alignment not really being a consideration with that anymore mm -hmm. uh, takes the remaster I think there's re room take that role. yeah I think there's room to kind of let Iomide go because paladin yeah. doesn't mean what it used to anymore and I think she's yeah. kind of run her course my money is on Asmodeus. <laughs> Partially Maybe. because of the OGL ties. I think that's possible. I think that would mean some crazy things for Cheliax. Uh, mm -hmm. And they've done so much with Cheliax already, I think they still want to let it cool. Then, that's that's my fair. Personal opinion. 
That's fair. But again, I have absolutely zero data on this. This is just my own insane things. Yeah. I, I'd, I, I'd be okay if a rastal just kind of went away. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's just, that's just me. Yeah. I mean, there, there's some deities in the court uh, 20 that are just kind of there to fill a slot, I yeah. feel, yeah. In, in some way. And, like, freelancers like myself and other Paizo staff have taken them and managed to breathe some additional life into them. But, yeah. you know, there's still kind of an air of, oh, we need one that's the paladin deity. We need one that's the assassin deity. We need one that's the magic deity. Mm -hmm. We need one that's the druid deity. Yeah. Right, exactly, which is this <laughs> yep. one here. So, yeah. And I mean, as we've seen, you could spice it up and help it a lot, but, you know, after a little while, there's just only so much you can do. So, right. I yeah, mean, especially... I love the idea of killing off one of the core and shaking it up. Yeah. Yeah, especially once you get rid of the alignment grid. Yeah. There's, there's so much less that you have to hold on to. Yeah. And exactly. It's like, uh, like Dave said, the alignment grid and the core 20 really existed side by side with mm -hmm. mo almost all well all of them having at least two yeah and without that restriction now you can play around a little more mm -hmm. right exactly and i think you know by the same nature of the remaster and everything no longer needing to be backwards compatible or somewhat backwards compatible and having that kind of session i think that really allows you to experiment a lot more and uh, Paizo's creative team is very happy to do that, I'm pretty sure. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, well, yeah. it's not. But that, <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. that's okay. The, the the other dwarven gods are awesome, too. Like, Trude and Bulka are. Oh. Yeah, uh, Trude and Bulka were both written by Shan Wolf, who's a good friend of mine. Nice. And uh, he specifically came to me and he was like, hey, um,. I think I want to add in Trude's write up that he and Caden have a bit of a thing, and I'm like, do it. That's a, yes, that, that was it. amazing. That was amazing. Yes, we love that. I loved it. <laughs> Absolutely love that. Yeah. That was yeah. That was great. I love how you said stuff. <laughs> yes. Oh, he's. What's up, Jason? You, oh, I have. I only have one other thing, uh, and that's just the something somebody pointed out to me years ago and I've never been able to unsee it is uh, if you reverse the order of Gozer's name of course it uh, it's a, it happens to be the same name of a particularly nature obsessed German filmmaker yes yes I did notice from that our, uh, from, oh. from our uh, from our own timeline yeah. here on, yeah. on our yeah. think quick oh. nudge 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 yep. nudge I never I guess they, they did me Emily. They did. They, they yeah, played. I, yeah. I don't know how intentional that is, but huh. Okay. Yeah. Red and tooth and claw and all that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, before we go, uh uh Jason and Dave, where can where can our listeners find you online? If you want to plug yourself. Sure. My name is Jason. I run a account called What Do You Do Pods. Uh, that's mostly been on Twitter, and as that's gotten shaken up over the last year or so here, things uh, they're a little more chaotic. But if you go to a website, bit.ly slash paizo, P-A-I-Z-O, A-D-V, P-O-D-S, uh, I'll send it to Jason to put in the show notes. <laughs> But it's a, a link to all of the actual play podcasts of the Paizoverse that I have found, which is not to say that it's exhaustive of all of them, and I'm always happy to take corrections, updates, additions, and anything that needs to go on there. Pretty basic Google spreadsheet, but maybe it'll help you find your next favorite Pathfinder or Starfinder podcast, actual play podcast. Thanks. Thank you. And Dave. Hey. Likewise, I used to be on Twitter. I refuse to call it its new name. Uh, <laughs> but uh, with everything happening in my life thus far, I took a break from it and realized I didn't miss it all that much. Uh, so I am currently on Blue Sky. 
at uh, Davik the Great, D A V I C uh, T H E G R E Y. Again, I'll have it said in the show notes. But uh, I'm just kind of rebuilding myself slowly there. Um, don't have a lot of time to be on social media right now. But um, if anybody needs any freelancing or editing work for Pathfinder 2 or Starfinder, I am quite proficient in that. I've contributed to, I think I hit 15 Paizo uh, credits just uh, earlier this year, nice. which is not half bad. Uh, so if anybody needs me to take a look at anything, I'd be happy to talk to them. Awesome. Corey, you want to plug your stuff? Yeah, yeah. I, you can find uh, me around the internet. Usually Corey Marie 21 just about any social media site, uh, including the aforementioned former Twitter and Blue Sky. I write and edit for three-time Eisner award-winning Women Write About Comics. And uh, I also write for Comics Beat every now and again. And a few articles here and there on SideQuest which is uh, Wawak's sister gaming site. And all of my articles there have been for Pathfinder 2 reviews, so. Phenomenal. Nice. And as for myself, y- you're listening to the podcast, so you, you know you know who I am and where to, where to find me. So, and I will leave it at that. And... We will be back next month with another edition of Dubious Knowledge, and I don't know who it's going to be yet, so that's why I can't tease it for you. I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Take it easy, everybody. See you. All right. Bye. Have a good one. Bye-bye.